special event that's being uh, put on by Astro Tours as well as um, the Indigenous Astronomy Workshop and Indigenous Education Week here at the University of Toronto. Um, this has allowed us to bring in a panel that will be talking about Indigenous astronomy um, and how it is enhancing our understanding of astrophysics. And Professor Renee Holchek, who is an astronomer at the Dunlop Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics here at U of T, is moderating the discussion tonight. Um, and so I will let her take it from here. share a piece that I wrote um, for the newly launched um, festival this, this past year. Um, I called it uh, To Toronto Star Maps. So this is just by way of introducing myself to everybody here. I am a visitor on a dish with one spoon treaty territory, home of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, Patoon, Mississaugas, and the New Credit River. Generative space-making practices of African descendants, Black, Caribbean, and diasporic cultural expressions and languages live in this place. Your sonic visual activations and genealogies are here in Toronto. Your relationships to the land in this place where the trees stand in the water, at the water's edge, becomes our praxis of projects of love and joy. In introducing myself to you, witnesses, hopeful accomplices, 
It is important to acknowledge that the complicated histories, exiles, displacements, and violent upheavals of Afro-Diasporic and brown bodies demand a different kind of knowledge, and thus extend a different kind of territorial acknowledgement, whose reach extends towards honoring and acknowledging space placemaking practices of black traditions, consciousness, and languages on Turtle Island in relationship with indigenous Turtle Island folks. The shapes of our collectives, that working group, that Black Daddies Club, that gathering of accomplices camped out at the police station, those gatherings of spatial liberation, spatial projects of black and indigenous love and joy. Territorial activations in Tikaranto at this water's edge with these particular tree markers, trees becoming cartographies, shaping choreographies of spatial liberation. So I consider perhaps these moments of decolonial points of rupture in the state systems in which we find ourselves Perhaps these moments are found in the alleyways, the dark corners, the lighting up of dark spaces through the technologies of coded colors, red ochres, indigos, coppers, that spray can contouring, resisting, and resurging these precious moments, creating portals to an otherwise. Those spaces, Ashen Crawley, you dream into being. We transport into otherwise spaces through walking through these bone-infused concretes, mortar, into our spatial liberation that wall, that home, that spray can. And then I think perhaps these moments, these glitches where our desires come forward, perhaps it is in the sounds, the songs, the provocations, the syncopations, where the ruptures, the portals are also laid bare. Perhaps the voices of that collective singing those songs on these traditional territories of Wendat, Putun, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit River, forever dreaming and envisioning within this slipstream located at these places where these trees are forever standing in the water. And that's what Tecoranto actually translates to, the place where the trees stand in the water. The CN Tower is choreographing our movements within this space. It is rooted rhizomatically downward towards the terrestrial and the subaqueous, but it's also tentacularly rooted and celestially rooted. The CN Tower helps us urban indigenous folks orient ourselves to this space. This is that that uh, steel tree that stands in the water that is to Toronto. And this is how I've learned to orient myself as a diasporic Cree person living in this territory as a visitor. I'll just make this a little bit quicker. I have a whole poem, but <laughs> um, I think about dark matter. Hold these stars in this space. This is my provocation, my prayer for space. We should all have one. Kinstellatory provocations in urban spaces that overflow the boundaries of land as a colonial scape. Those surges outward that carry all that is loving, feeding us with that big spoon in the sky to Toronto, but take only what you need. This is our ethic of witnessing, of visiting, and accomplishing. Take only what you need, people. So we can become these vessels through which we time travel. At the water's edge is our gathering space where we can hear the sounds of these two sister stars reverbing off of each other, issuing a call, waiting for our response. What are the sonic vibrations shaping this space? How does water communicate with these buildings? How are we orienting ourselves towards these waters? What words can I say as a Cree visitor to ask permission to be here, where these trees stand in the water? What are the gestures and the choreographies of my being here? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, why don't you tell us also about your own Oh, sorry, I was hoping you meant to plug online. I grew up in New Land and Labrador. Uh, as a land, it's been rather challenging because you know, if we have the genocide of the Gothic, we have the erasure of our First Nations that have been there through the Big Mall. Uh, the Inuit and the residential schools. And so my journey sort of goes through um, learning about my past, my grandparents, their parents, and how they basically were, not, were never acknowledged. And so one of the things I wanted to do as I was in university is try to learn about that history. Uh, and that, which broadly, more broadly speaking, is the history of Canada as we know it. Uh, so as I've been at the University of Toronto, I wanted to try to find ways to bridge indigenous knowledge with astronomy as much as I can. And 
really, I'm the last person who should be sitting up here because I am as much a student as anybody else in this field. Uh, so I'm very honored to be here. Frank, we were talking a little bit earlier about your passion for uh, Indigenous astronomy knowledge. Can you tell us more about that? I guess I'll try it a little bit. Um, I didn't compose any uh, fancy nice poetry, so uh, I think the only thing I can say really is that, um, as you pointed out, I've been an amateur astronomer for uh, most of my life, since I was pretty tiny. Um, I think the only thing to really add is that the, um, uh, one of the aspects of, of amateur astronomy or any astronomy is studying the star lore of constellations. So I started to do this a long time ago. Um, Probably when I was a little kid, my mother took us home to her reserve in North Ontario for summer uh, vacation sort of thing. So I talked to some uncles, and they're not around anymore, but they um, told me these various versions of star lore that are very different from the Greek Roman mythology you'd find in any astronomy textbook. And that's when I became interested in, um, in, in my case, the Anishinaabek or Ojibwe uh, cultural versions of some constellations. And so um, and, and it got more interesting when I talked to another uncle and I told him about it and said, well, this is really neat. And he said, no, no, that's not correct. I'll tell you what actually happens with this constellation. And then I became aware of it because they had worked in different areas. I think one was maybe um, learned some astronomy, um, pilot, piloting boats on Lake Nipissing and French River at night maybe. And another uncle who had worked in lumber camps in northern Quebec maybe. So I became aware that there are regional variations of the same legend in the same language group. Um, across different regions with different climate and uh, geography and so on. So um, I started to study it more and more, and just as a hobby, of course, is one aspect of astronomy. And um, uh, I guess uh, what's, what I find interesting is that, say, Ursa Major or Big Dipper or Orion, as it varies across the whole continent with different language groups and different uh, variations from um, uh, different uh, regions within one area, like, say, British Columbia, where there's a huge range in uh, geography and climate, for instance, or across uh, northern Ontario and northern Quebec, the differences there too. So, um, to sum it up, my only real uh, reason for having studied constellation star lore and, and in, indigenous uh, star lore is uh, because I find it interesting and I found it really, really more interesting with studying the different variations across the continent among different languages, culture groups, and regions. So, I think that's um, all I can really have. Great, thank you. Yeah. Feel free to answer uh, any of these. We'll start with you, Jose. Uh, I'll, I'll ask them all three, and you can. You know. um, so the first is, how do you use your, uh, how do you use indigenous knowledge in your specific discipline? Uh, what has surprised you as you learn and weave indigenous knowledge into your field or practice? Um, and then, uh, something that came up in our workshop today is, how do you balance the role of listener, storyteller, um, and observer when engaging with some of this content? Um, that's an easy question, so. There were five, so. <laughs> I think one of the things I've really learned as I've started learning about indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing is really how we do science and trying to reflect on how it is we tend to do science and science and science physics. That we have a set of axioms or ideas and theories and that we tend to generalize, where it's you know, in various examples I've learned to understand as much, uh, indigenous knowledge is very much of a place. It's of a person. The observer, you know, the observer is, is as much important of the knowledge as the effect itself. Whereas, you know, when we do astronomy, we really want to try to take the observer out of the equation or out of, out of the effect. So, because we want to isolate this. And I think, with that knowledge, you sort of think, I've been thinking of more and more as, as, as everything, the way we're doing it is a reasonable, you know. When we talk about cosmology, where you have no choice but to be part of the observations, you know, how does that play a role? And I think, really, it's a lot, it's an opportunity for me just to reflect on the, the how of science as opposed to the what of science. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Karen, do you want to take a step in this? So I was thinking about uh, what has surprised me about um, <laughs> indigenous knowledge. <laughs> about bringing, bringing it into one's field of practice. Okay. Um, 
So what has surprised me about bringing indigenous knowledge into my own practice? Um, I mean, when I started uh, off in university, I was an indigenous studies student for a very long time, and I did my PhD and my master's in indigenous studies. And so um, often I was posed with the question that since I am Cree, um, that I would know what a Cree process of research was. And so everyone was like, oh, well, what's the Cree methodology for this? And I felt like really inadequate because I didn't have the Cree methodology. And it made me feel like, um, like I was less, sort of like a less than kind of scholar. Um, but then I started realizing as I witnessed um, Billy Ray Belcourt, who was here today um, for his book launch, um, as I witnessed his work, that what he was doing was Cree methodology. And what he was talking about was um, what's, this is gonna sound crazy, but sort of what, what is lovable within rupture. So kind of like decolonial love, you know, how do we fall in love with our rupturous selves? And so that made me feel like, okay, I can completely relate to this. Like there is something really beautiful and loving about rupture. And I had a conversation with Buffy St. Marie once. I, I was um, sort of like an arts administrator in my former life, and we, um, I got the opportunity to pick Buffy St. Marie up from the airport. <laughs> and so um, we had a conversation, and I said, I just, I'm in love with the stars. And she says, well, me too. And we were talking about the 60s scoop and how so many of us have been scooped, um, you know, um, into the foster care system and into adoption. And we were talking about that and, and she says, you know why you love stars? And I said, no. I said, I don't, I don't know why I love stars, I just do. And she said, because stars and space, there's so much rupture going on up there. That the 60s scoop, that initial rupture from not being able to be raised by my Cree mother, that initial rupture, I've had to create a narrative to fall in love with that rupture. And so for me, my relationship to Indigenous knowledge is celestial because of the possibilities of falling in love with our rupture selves that I believe that my thinking about star worlds and worlds otherwise kind of gesture towards. So I had to come to know Indigenous knowledge on my own terms. Um, and it took me a really long time to get there. That's great. And I'm still totally in awe of this indigenous knowledge, these indigenous knowledges, plural, that exist in these worlding practices. Great, thank you. Frank, did you want to uh, tackle any of these? Uh, not really. But, uh, uh, I think your question was uh, how do I apply to practice and so on. And of course, I'm not a professor instructing or a teacher in any form, so I don't really apply it. I just study for my own need. Um, the only place I might possibly apply it would be in uh, public star parties. So we, we mentioned that I'm a member of the Royal Ashton Society of Canada. Great group, I don't know, some of you may be members, and they did a really great outreach, uh, public outreach for astronomy. And so in the past few years, I've spent many, many hours, um, and so uh, with the telescope set up, and one thing about so-called sidewalk astronomy is that um, where we do it in Pickering, where I live, and it's one of the locations where the RDSC Toronto Centre does outreach. Um, hundreds of people come by, and any one night, especially in the summertime, along the boardwalk in southern Pickering, um, many are um, really uh, have never looked through a telescope before, and they say, What are you doing here? And we see a telescope set up, so we point to a sign we have saying that we're doing public outreach for, for the public just to um, show the stars. And so, a lot of people are really astonished to look through with my telescope, or any of our telescopes for the first time in their life, like the Moon or Saturn. And so um, so some just move on, they want to uh, try to take a picture of a cell phone through the eyepiece or something, move on, that's fine. But some are pretty curious and interested, they ask questions. And um, so I'm glad to uh, point out a few constellations if they're curious. Um, and they ask about the legends associated. And I can mention the um, uh, the standard textbook uh, Greek legend, and it's usually about gods and goddesses and uh, love affairs and hate affairs and things that don't really apply much to people. And say, okay, that's fine, it makes a lovely story, but I also try to tell them the um, local indigenous uh, story, and it's much more interesting. So um, I think um, people agree, so it's, it's much more relevant than there's living plants and animals and things that interact with the sky and stars and these legends. 
So um, I think that's the main, really the only way I apply my, my knowledge to public, share it with the public. So I guess that's, that's my point. Great. I'd like to stick with that actually just for, for a moment. Um, so in um, Tswana people, where I'm from in South Africa, call Orion, three stars in Orion, uh, which are the three, um, the three dogs chasing the three pigs. Uh, and I looked this up this afternoon um, because there are many different um, indigenous peoples in South Africa and they have different stories. And I was excited to kind of bring my, my story. But one of the reasons for producing Orion is that I found an article that you had written for the RAC detailing different um, uh, indigenous stories from around Canada about Orion's belt. How did that process happen? How did you start the journey of collecting the stories? Well, uh, how do I start? Uh, first, first way to answer is to say um, a lot of you may be interested in astronomy, and you think you've heard that I've been uh, interested in astronomy for most of my life. And so it's easy for me to say astronomy is really, really interesting. It's just naturally beautifully interesting. So a lot of you might agree. A lot of you might be here because you like astronomy. So, like, so how do I get started? Uh, I think I mentioned that um, uh, one of my uncles in the uh, back of the reserve mentioned uh, one of the indigenous uh, legends for one of the constellations, and that's how I got interested in finding out more because it was very different from the standard textbook uh, Greek Roman uh, mythology. So that's probably how I got started. Um, you asked about the Orion uh, constellation. Um, well, that's a very interesting one. Um, so um, it's a very famous, well-known constellation. So when I researched that one, there's quite a lot of quite a big range of um, legends across North America. But um, want me to give you a couple? Yes. Okay. Um, if, 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 I'll just give you a start off quickly with the Greek standard textbook Greek uh, mythology. It's about um, some um, messy details about a hate affair, and um, uh, one version has a, a, some jealous wife of a, a major uh, god, uh, Jupiter or Zeus, um, sending a creature to go and kill um, this, this mighty hunter, Orion. Um, so it's a scorpion, uh, and it's opposite the sky to, um, to Orion. And that's fine, that's one version. Another version is um, some, um, sending, some, uh, sending some other uh, evil or harm to him in, in revenge for something or else. And that's fine, so there's all these emotional jealousies and hatreds going on. but the um, uh, there's also some um, uh, competition going on. One of these uh, legends, that one of my favorites, it's actually my favorite about the uh, Orion constellation, and this takes place in British Columbia, what we call British Columbia, um, before it was called British Columbia. Um, it's actually uh, the interior coast regions. There's a lot of, quite a lot of uh, uh, indigenous groups there, and so one of them, skipping a lot of details, um, happens to have the uh, legend that the um, three main uh, stars in Orion, maybe. Is everybody familiar with the constellation of Orion? Yeah. Probably. So the defining point is really the three bright stars in the middle, three very bright stars that you mentioned in the name. Um, and so in this one particular legend, uh, they are representing the uh, Cold Wind Brothers. So the Cold Wind Brothers have a canoe represented by these three bright stars. Fine, it's a canoe. Uh, south of it, you may be familiar with uh, some fainter stars that um, hang southward from, from the belt stars, as we call them. And it's called the sword stars. We generally think of it as sword stars in Orion. Everybody familiar with that sword? Mm -hmm. So um, in this uh, legend, they represent uh, can the uh, canoe of the warm uh, Chinook wind brothers. So the Chinook wind is a warm wind, so it's opposite the cold wind. So they're in a race competition to get to a salmon. Salmon is represented by a smaller, fainter star, the most main belt star. So the point is, uh, both canoes, uh, the cold wind brothers canoe and the Chinook wind Brothers who are heading toward the salmon, they're going to race to get the salmon. It's quite a competition. Um, the legend involves a big wrestling match that develops and so on, but the main point is I find it very interesting or, or fun to, to see it as a canoe race between uh, the Cold Wind Brothers and the um, Chinook Brothers canoe. So that's canoe race is one version. Um, I'll give you one other uh, contrast to the legend. And this takes place, um, does it matter where it takes place? Yes, it does. Uh, the uh, Navajo um, uh, Navajo uh, tribe is fairly well known. A lot of people know that it's in Arizona, a corner of Arizona in the southwestern USA, basically a desert. And so, um, part of their creation story had them emerging from the ground in some particular spot and making a long, difficult journey to another spot, another location where life is more livable. And so. Uh, the constellation of Orion represents a character called, generally known as Long Slender One, or sometimes a Tall Slender One. 
Um, another name for a neighboring group calls, that's not uh, Navajo, but very similar uh, nearby, calls them long sash. So let's just call it long sash. It's a bit easier to pronounce. So um, the constellation that we see as Orion represents this character called long sash, long sash who was a hero, a hero for his uh, people, who emerged out of the ground, um, had a lot of con a lot of difficulties surviving, uh, a lot of uh, creatures, a lot of, a lot of um, difficulties surviving, and so they agreed that they had to move something, move somewhere and find a better place to live because it was just unbearable where, where they emerged from the ground. And so they selected Long Sash as their, as their leader. And so Long Sash agreed he'll take them on a journey, he'll do his, <coughs> excuse me, do his best to take them on a journey to where he thinks it'll be better. And they have a lot of difficulties, so there's a lot of details in the story about where they stopped at certain uh, place the decision to decide if they can really continue on or not, but they had to overcome a lot of internal uh, conflicts and difficulties, and um, these stopping places are represented by some stars in what we call Gemini, Pollux and Castor, and a couple of other stars, which I could point out, but um, the main point is that after a long, difficult journey, Long Shash gets his people to a new place where they live now, and they can live in peace and harmony, and they had to overcome a lot of difficulties, a lot of internal strife, competition, they had to learn how to get along, and now they're doing it. So, uh, Long Sash is a, a hero, or a leader, that got them there, and what we call the Milky Way is the path that they follow uh, to get to their current location. So, um, that's two separate legends of Orion. That's great, thank you so much. That's excellent. Um, okay, so, uh, I want to spend now a little bit uh, more to uh, discussion of bringing uh, <coughs> indigenous knowledge into uh, curricula. Um, and there are there are some challenges that uh, we face along the well, that one faces along the way. Um, we had a beautiful opening this morning by Elder, Elder Andrew Wesley, and he he told us about uh, snow geese and their migration pattern. And he talked about observing the snow geese before they fly away. They actually circle for a long time until they find a current, and that current, once they find it, provides uh, the ability to travel for long distances without using all one's resources. So it gives you that current so that you don't have to tie yourself out. I'm aware that this journey of really integrating indigenous knowledge into the community and confronting um, uh, Western science, not keeping them separate, there are challenges. So my question, my very long question would be, uh, how can we collectively find the current to, to as we go on this journey? So that's question one. Um, and then question two, somewhat related, is. Uh, what are the effective tools that we can use to build community within a diaspora, whether it be astronomy diaspora, um, indigenous diaspora, uh, etc.? So we'll start maybe with you, Ken. That's okay. <coughs> um, so recently, um, recently I was, uh, I had the privilege of um, participating in an activation. Um, a few activations actually, I've been kind of blessed with uh, being able to be participant in a few, and one of them was with a choreographer, dance choreographer named Emily Johnson, who's a Yupik um, dance maker, choreographer, and um, Emily invited me to do a workshop with um, this collective of people, of folks that gathered for an all-night gathering in New York City. Um, Randall Island, is anybody familiar with Randall Island? Yeah, so that's where it was. And so the idea is that we would all spend the night together um, under the stars. And so it was a star gathering. And um, my activation that I was able to do there was about um, mimicking constellations um, on this terrestrial space with just something simple like tea lights um, to mimic the constellations and then to read out love letters to the future. And some of those letters were really quite amazing and thoughtful. Um, and generative and beautiful. Um, so I think that there is a lot um, that can be shared through, um, I would say, like arts-based practices. Um, there is this one artist from the Northwest Territories who does, um, who beads galaxies, who like beads nebulas. Um, and I wrote about them in a piece that I was, an article that I wrote, so I can pull that up and I can tell you what this person's name name was. Um, but there's also this piece um, by my friend Star, her name is appropriately Star Renko, who's Cree Métis from Saskatchewan. 
um, uh, uh, yeah, from Saskatchewan for practices, her dance practice in um, Vancouver. And uh, she's choreographed this piece where um, it kind of confronts sort of the violence against Indigenous bodies um, through constellations. So um, the dance maker has a scrim in the background, which is all um, star worlds, and gathers stars and places them on oh, an Indigenous woman's body. So it's like, it's like star mapping on the body um, as a form of sort of reclaiming Indigenous lives and Indigenous space and place and reorienting and realigning ourselves to what it means to be alive as Indigenous folks in, in occupied territories. So, um, so that gives me hope when I see um, activations such as that. And they're all over. I mean, this beautiful elder, Wendat Elder here, has um, curated and choreographed um, the Walking With Our Sisters installation by uh, Christy Belcourt into the Milky Way. And this is an installation that is so, so important for Indigenous folks um, that uses um, the vamps, uh, beaded vamps of uh, moccasins as um, a pathway to honor the lives of missing and murdered Indigenous folks. So the Walking With Our Sisters installation um, as the Milky Way, like in each um, territory that this, um, that this activation uh, resides, the elders in the community curate it. So they create the lodge or the space in which these vamps are to be laid. And here in Toronto, it was celestial. So I think that really speaks a lot to the urgency of indigenous lives in indigenous lands, like right now, and how connected we are to the celestial as um, as a means of our survivance, but also we look to the stars to ensure that we also have a futurity too. Um, that Afrofuturity and indigenous futurities, these are really, really important knowledge centers for thinking through how we can be together in radical relationship um, in Toronto, for example. We don't see a lot of stars from here. <laughs> I mean, I, my, my balcony in Little Italy is like, I can see maybe three stars if I'm lucky. <laughs> but for some of us um, who, you know, going home might not be an easy journey. Um, for some of us who have been survivors of the 60s scoop and of residential schools and this intergenerational crap that we've been dealt with. Um, for some of us, our going home star is our ancestor but also is our future. So we need to align ourselves to these stars. It's, it's a matter of survivance for some of us. And so that's why when I saw how you would choreograph that installation, I fell in love with it because it's so relevant to this moment that we honor these, these lives celestially. Um, yeah. Hilda, would you like to speak to other of those? Uh, I guess I'll try to speak to it in terms of trying to work in an astronomy classroom where in an astronomy faculty where there are almost no indigenous people in this country in astronomy faculty positions or physics. And most of our students, very few of our students are from indigenous heritage. So I think when we want to bring indigenous knowledge into there, we're really trying to help people of non-Indigenous backgrounds appreciate the land that we are sitting in and appreciate the peoples that are here. Um, and in doing so, one of the first, probably the hardest thing is to break down, at least in my mind, to break down the preconceptions of what is science. Um, you know, I, taught, I teach a first year seminar in first class. This, I ask students, is this scientific? And they will specify something like the scientific method. They will go straight to a, a very European knowledge base. And trying to change that mindset, I think, is, a, is one of the more important things we need to do. Because it, if, if we can do that, then ideally, we can help us uh, from the 
western side to appreciate where we are and the people that are the people who live here. It's great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, so it actually fits well with the kind of follow up, which is we've spoken a little bit about um, language and the, the tension uh, that is created through language between western science and, as you said, the scientific method and um, indigenous science. and. Uh, so how can we, question one to, to everyone, we, how can we change that language? How can we make the dialogue um, more open um, rather than trying to convince one side or the other? Because often that turns into a, de you know, sort of a debate or argument rather than listening. Um, and then another question, which is a, a selfish question. Um, I learned about co-learning today um, uh, from, uh, that was uh, a coin, a traditional, and so my question would be, uh, how does one balance non-indigenous allyship um, with giving spaces and voices to indigenous people? What is the space of, of people who want to advance the integration of, or the changing of language between uh, Western science and indigenous science? There are many questions that you can answer, any of them. And this is, in again, anyone can, can tackle on this one. You want to give it to Apparently, I volunteered. <laughs> I guess the first thing I would say, something I've been trying to learn uh, for a long time, is, is how to stop and listen. Uh, this morning, we had a, a lovely talk from Molly Jeffrey, who's a faculty in the Center for Indigenous Study, who reminded us about listening for three years. Um, you know, you listen uh, for three years, and you listen with your heart. And I think. In astronomy, we tend to focus on, academically, we focus on the data, the math, the observation, etc. And we're not necessarily listening to the intent or the purpose or the desires of in that, in that respect. Because we're very um, goal or object oriented. And I think if we want to open up space, we have to stop and listen. I think a little thing more specifically we could, we could be doing is, um, you know, Frank told us this lovely story where we focus on our, uh, words like Orion, Gemini, Pollux. You know, these are Greek, Latin, Arabic names. Uh, I would love, I looked at a book in Cree, and I have no idea. The language is incredibly beautiful but complex. Uh, and I think I would love to see a star map and I see the same stars listed in those languages. Well, okay, then I'm going to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I should say, if you, there are groups doing this. Um, Wilfred Buck is an astronomer in Manitoba has been doing this with Ojibwe knowledge. And that we in the U.S. been doing this with Dakota and Dakota knowledge. So there are peoples around doing this. And I think the biggest problem is we have to stop listen to them right. and they build on that. Did anyone else want to take it in the first? No thanks. Um, I can't really, it's a complex question and uh, I think Golden did a good job regarding some points and so for me I can't really think of anything uh, reasonable or, or constructive to add to it so I'm going to pass on that. Um, so I was, I was thinking about Hi, we're talking about language, and um, and sometimes the languages are like I'm really super interested as well in what like the the Cree concepts are, and in in this territory, you know, thinking through what are the Wendat, what are the Anishinaabe, what are these concepts. Um, so I feel like if we were to um, really like listen to that then i feel like what we'd see in the star worlds are renaturated mappings like i really strongly feel that um that some of these mappings in star worlds have nothing to do with sort of the the practices that we're seeing here today in these worlds so, <laughs> and i feel like the renaturated mappings are probably like there's this one um, amazing scholar, Alex Wilson from Saskatchewan, who's a two-spirit scholar, 
who does amazing work. Um, and I don't want to share this knowledge because I don't have the protocol, I haven't done the protocols to be able to share it. Um, but just to know that um, the ideas of gender in Star Worlds are very different. Like once you start accessing indigenous language systems, so this whole idea of the warrior, like the male warrior with the sword, like these ideas are very different when you think through, because um, it's. If I feel like the stars are all about governance too, like how we we govern ourselves um, constellatorily. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like in these stories that have been shared with you, like I feel like there's probably concepts of governance, of like how we be together in this spatial realm, in these stories. So I'm super curious about that. Um, but also like thinking through what are the gestures? And this is where I'm thinking about language. Like if I knew some of the knowledge that you have about like stars and how they're created and the overflow of stars in space, um, I think we have some language to talk about um, how we uh, how we engage in social like in solidarity making practices and how we engage social change. Like I really do believe that our our ancestors and our elders knew this, knew to look to the stars to figure out how to be together in radical relationship and in intimacies that where we've only touched the surface of the potentials of creative intimacies with each other. It's like we're so fixated on like sex and things like that, but there's m immense possibilities for creative intimacies that I think can come from star knowledge and, and thinking through what are the processes of stars creating, what are, the, what are the processes of constellations coming together, what is the process of dark matter, and how does dark matter gravitationally pull bodies together? Like I think if we had that language, that I think that we could really like transform this world. <laughs> you know, I think we can jump scale from the violences that we're seeing, um, from the missing and murdered. Um, like I really do believe that it is written in the stars. And Wilfred Buck talks about like we're under this blanket of stars. But we're also like underneath the blanket of stars too, because we're star people. So I think that that's really interesting. And within that slipstream, there's like immense possibilities for how, how we can radically re relate to each other. So I do think that maybe the Greeks and Romans got it right by thinking about love, because I think love is there. And there is a constellation actually that's called in, in Cree, love. So we know that. So that's why I'm saying that, like, perhaps if we knew more about the languages, um, then we can mimic those same practices on how we can radically relate to each other in a good way. That's great, thank you. So I'm aware that um, I want to give the audience time to engage as well, and I, and I know I've been holding the mic, so to speak. Um, so we have, two, we have two microphones at the back. Uh, if possible. So what I'd like to do is make sure that all of our speakers can uh, choose between uh, two questions. So if you can go to uh, uh, the mic if possible, and if not, we can, we can try and bring the mic to you based on their mobility issues. Uh, but if we can have maybe one on either side of the mic if possible, so that we can ask two questions in a row. Uh, so go ahead. Right, so this one's a little bit long when hearing you mention things about the universe, like how these people are interconnected in terms of star people, kind of reminds me about how Carl Sagan has put up the term about how star stuff contemplating the stars and he's kind of putting this kind of mythical flair onto science and of course adding on evolutionary biology that as it says, we all come from the same descendants, so every one of us are distant relatives to each other in that sense. So if it's one species and a universe where we're on this little blue dot, I guess, how can we tie in some of these concepts to the indigenous knowledge and maybe bring forth the idea realizing maybe we're not that, you're not that different after all? Anyone, everyone, anyone of course welcome to 
give an answer. Thank yes. you. Thank you. So we'll take the other question as well, and then we'll close two at a time. Um, so, so uh, I'm not in Native American descent, so I'm just sort of curious as to this angle. To me, it sounds like that there would be a sort of innate personal, a sense of responsibility to be descended from a tribe that's very old and from a, like, fighting for survival in this culture and to try and maintain that knowledge and the knowledge of the, the independence and uh, variants of the different tribes and their cultures. How do you, assuming that that feeling is there, how do you reconcile that to like make peace with learning about that knowledge of your ancestors and uh, become like become comfortable and safe that you're. Sorry, I'm not saying it very well. How do you reconcile that uh, responsibility? And become comfortable with it. Of uh, because it's not like a huge responsibility of being like a custodian of, of all this ancient knowledge and all these people. And how do you internalize that? And become comfortable with it. Thank you. I'll volunteer the answer to that the second question because it's um, regarding uh, being a custodian of ancient knowledge. Uh, I don't see it as a problem. Uh, I don't see it as being necessary to um, protect or propagate or continue on uh, what is ancient knowledge from, in my case, some elders or from, from some elders, but in some other cases, it's uh, a lot of published literature that I read and get my information from. Um, it's already public information. It's already well known. It's already uh, published in archives, uh, maybe several decades old, uh, maybe well, maybe ten years old. Um, maybe in some plaques in national parks, or maybe some uh, talking to some uh, elders when I visit some, say, U.S. national park and wherever. And there's a um, um, uh, native group there doing tours, or um, sometimes talk to them, ask them questions. Um, so uh, the short answer to your question is, I see it, is. Um, I'm not uh, responsible for holding on to ancient knowledge. It's just public information, in my opinion, and it's all information, so that um, anybody is welcome to use it. It's not uh, secret. It's not protected. Uh, it shouldn't be. Uh, or if it is, if the nations, um, particular nations, say that our, our ancient um, story is um, protected, we don't want to share. We don't want to publish. Then that's fine. We won't do that. I won't ask, or I certainly won't uh, publish it or, or share it. But a lot of it is public information. Um, and it's not secret or protected. So that's my quick answer to your question. That it's not a problem. Thank you. Other of you want to tackle either question? To be honest, I think if, if an elder or a knowledge builder is going to share something with me, I don't want to be comfortable with it. Because they're sharing something personal with me. And so that's important. How we use that knowledge, of course, is entirely up to them. As Frank mentioned, there's protocols, and they have some of the knowledge is sacred and protected. But you know, until we're in a society where we can, where we can align our the Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge on equal footing, I think we do have a responsibility to be uncomfortable with it and to care for it with that respect. I don't know why, but for some reason. I thought about sugar beet farms. <laughs> I'm not sure why. I think, I think for my like my biological family in Saskatchewan, my uncle um, was made to work in a sugar beet farm when he was young for a very, very, very long time with very little pay and was starving. Um, so, indigenous folks, it feels like have always had to be on the move in some way. And um, I feel like perhaps there are protocols for how to move between spaces and places. And some people in my family know what those protocols are. And some of us shared with me because I started traveling a lot one year. And, and my uncle, um, Joseph Netauhau, told me to put um, cedar in my shoes so that when I'm crossing borders and I'm going into spaces that 
and protected, so that you don't pick up stuff, right? So, um, so I almost feel like this relationship to stars, um, for a lot of people, a lot of nations, and a lot of tribes that have been on the move a lot, have had to learn about stars. Like, it's not just a curiosity. Like, I feel like, I feel like folks have had to know about stars, about where they are, about how to get home, about where home is. Um, so for me, it's like, um, it is still survivance practices. Like, I feel like our kids, like my daughter's six right now, um, but when I, when I was birthday, like just before, when I, I don't know how to say it, when I was pregnant, I guess, um, I thought about her name, and I asked my uncle to give me a name that would be like, how do you, how do you name somebody after um, those those people that are going to have to make their journey at nighttime? And um, I started thinking about how do we imbue our children with the knowledge that they're going to need to survive into the future. Like when the water stuff happens. You know, when things start going down, <laughs> like our children are gonna have to know how to get, you know, to where they need to be. And so these are ancient practices of reading the stars so that you know where you need to be, when you need to furtively travel, when you need to travel in a way that nobody else can see you. So you need to know how to travel at nighttime. So I think. For me, that was a very personal relationship. So in terms of us being descended from stars and about maybe we're not all that different, I'd ask about your family. You know, I'd ask about the movements of your family and those practices where perhaps star knowledge was a necessity. And then we can talk about like similarities or differences. But I think for, for a lot of folks, it's like, Survivance is about how we survive our movements from place to place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman behind the question. Thank you, folks, for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions for uh, Frank, the amateur from uh, Royal Sun Society. Uh, one, um, I've seen uh, devices like lapel pins with, the, with what I understand are the four sacred, uh, the colors of the four sacred directions, red, white, yellow, and black. Are these reflected in things astronomical? And second, are there Anishinaabe lessons, uh, legends uh, about the pole star, and how do they vary between uh, Ontario and Quebec? Yes, great questions. Um, regarding the uh, uh, compass and directions, um, Yes, uh, short answer is yes. Longer answer is um, there are pretty long legends uh, describing each of the directions. So I'm not sure I can um, uh, want to elaborate on them now. It's just a. Uh, Please try. Uh, well, okay. Um, uh, we do have one tiny, tiny description out of the planetary stars that shows us starting, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe one, one of the directions. Well, certainly the uh, east, east direction is uh, the most important because it represents the sunrise. And so um, you see the east represented, you see the south represented, um, where the sun is in the highest, and you see the west represented where the sun sets, and north is uh, uh, Kiwadan. And um, like I said, uh, as I said, long legends associated with, with each. Can I pick one that's fairly short? Um, pretty tricky, but given the time restriction, I think I'll skip it for now. But the really question, uh, the second question was, uh, second question with each of you answer. Uh, North Star. Uh, yes. Star. Differences uh, in legends between uh, say Ontario and Quebec. Uh, uh, the answer is I'm not really up on that. Short. No. The answer is I'm not really sure because there aren't a lot of legends associated with it. Um, the main one, my favorite legend is that's easiest to remember, is um, that the uh, pole star is a small canoe. And so. Just there, one of the groups uses uh, represents the so-called Big Dipper as a large canoe, and I think it's Alabama, maybe it's from uh, southeastern USA. But um, one of the Ontario legends for the Polaris, several stars around with, with, including Polaris, are a small canoe. And the other ones, um, 
I have to skip because I'm not, I'm not, not up on them, so I have to skip at least some time. Yeah, I think we are really, really out of time. Uh, but so I'm going to conclude now. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hopefully, if there are additional questions, uh, you can engage with uh, Frank and also the other speakers outside. Uh, but let's take this moment. Thank you so much for sharing uh, with us. Thank you for coming.